The glory of his grace indeed. Mm. Such a beautiful message for us. We're going to be in Galatians chapter 3, if you'd like to turn there now. Uh, the translation I'll be reading out of is the NASB. Um, so if you've got something different, then the words are moved around, but it says the same thing. So, <clears throat> so uh, first let me, my name's David Klingscales. I'm the senior pastor here. I figured it would be uh, behoove me to reintroduce myself. It's been about three weeks since I've uh, come up here. Uh, we have the blessing of having uh, three amazing pastors who get to come up here and share our hearts uh, with you uh, as we're challenged uh, and strengthened and encouraged by the word uh, and even students uh, to, to share. Uh, so we, we love having that uh, opportunity, but I want to take a moment right here at the start to actually give us a picture of uh, what God is doing as we work on these messages, as we put things together, I want you to be able to see the through line that, that God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, is working out, even though that we don't get together and like write out our messages together. So three weeks ago, uh, I did my last message on this Galatians series called All of Grace. And uh, what I'm doing is I'm trying to form all of our minds around this concept of God's grace being the reason for our life and our breath. He is the reason why we are forgiven. He is the reason why we can live in pursuit of him in the first place. It is all by God's grace, hence all of grace. Um, and so three weeks ago, I talked about how grace is personified to us in Christ. Christ came and he became grace to us. Not only that, but he gave us the promise of what that grace means by giving us the Holy Spirit, giving us his spirit to dwell in us, to be with us, both Jesus and the Holy Spirit personified grace. And then, of course, the challenge was, well, then for us, we are made to be that grace. I mean, let's run to do it. Let's run to show grace. What, I don't know what's happening right now, but that's hilarious. <laughs> that's, that's my son. Uh, never a dull moment. Um, <laughs> Let's run to share this grace that we have been given, this grace that we have been shown. Well, sometimes that can be difficult. How do we show that? Then two weeks ago, Doug preached the message on dual citizenship. When we have trusted in Christ, when the Holy Spirit has come to be one with us and to guide us and direct us, we are then kind of dual citizens. Like we live here in America, but we're really, I mean, our, our citizenship is with God. And I don't want to even say in heaven, because if you've read to the end of the book, the end of the book is we're with God in the new heavens and the new earth. It's not going to be sweet uh, you know, pie in the sky by and by. We are going to be living with God in a new heavens and a new earth. So it's not just about heaven. It's about life now and life forevermore with Christ because of this dual citizenship. Now, sometimes that can be difficult, can't it? After the dedication of his baby brother, Little Johnny was sobbing all the way home from church, and his parents kept asking him, what's, what's wrong, buddy? What's wrong? Well, finally, after the third time, J little Johnny said through tears in his eyes, well, the, the pastor said that he wanted us to be raised up in a Christian home, and I want to stay with you. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Something was missed in translation, or perchance that was one of those beautiful kidney punches that kids can sometimes give their parents, and the Spirit uses to convict us. Ouch. 
yeah, you know, I could be walking in this grace that I'm called to be known by better than I am. Sometimes that's hard. So what happens when the grace that we're called to share doesn't often look like grace? Sometimes that means we need to ask for forgiveness. Last week, Zach and Jason gave us a great message on forgiveness. Zach pointed out that forgiveness is something that we're called to do, and yet it's the hardest thing in the world to do sometimes, isn't it? I mean, when we've been offended, we, well, yeah, I can forgive you, but you got to know, and I got to see you knowing what you did and how it hurt me. I want you to feel as bad as I feel. It can be the hardest thing in the world. This isn't an easy call to forgive. And yet, and Jason shared that we're called to forgive, and when we do that, we release the prisoner, only to find out that the prisoner is us. We're released from this prison of bitterness, of being shackled by the pain of what has been done to us and allowing that to control us. And so we release this prisoner. But let's, let's be honest. As they pointed out beautifully last week, it's not easy to do. It's not easy to forgive. It's not easy to live by the grace that we've been given. And it's not easy to share that grace with others. It's going to cost you. Think about what it cost Jesus. Did it cost Jesus anything to forgive the likes of you and I? We have to ask this question if we are to go to the Word because the Word asks these questions of us on every page. It's going to cost us to forgive. I loved how, and I just want to go back to this, Jason shared a picture of Amu Haji. And if you were here, then you know he is considered the world's dirtiest man. 60 years of not bathing And Jason pointed out, interestingly, that Amu is not against, and he's actually open to the idea of finding love. And what did Amu say? He said, well, you know, I I don't think women are going to take to me because I smoke. (laughs) And, And that's a funny picture, but man, isn't that just like us? When we look at others... When we call others to forgive us, our call is, well, of course, you know, it's not that bad. I I feel bad about it. And so I said, I'm sorry. So forgive me easily. But when someone wrongs us, oh, that's when it's hard. And we can be like Amu. We can think that the problem with people forgiving us is that we smoke, not that we're horribly dirty. And we miss the grace that God has given us in Christ. We miss that. And so this morning, we are talking about a grace by faith. A grace that is radically different from earning forgiveness or or trying to tell people what they need to do to earn your forgiveness. Or even about this process of trying to clean ourselves up so that we're more acceptable to God and to others. So before we get into the text, would you take a moment and pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your word. It is by your word that we learn of you. It is by your word that we can come to worship you. And it is by your living word that we are forgiven in the person of Jesus. We thank you so much for his sacrifice. And we know, we confess, even though we don't know the fullness of it, that your grace is great to us in Christ. And we so need you. And we need you here in this place now to understand your word as well. So teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Okay, so our text is Galatians 3, 8 through 14, but I'm going to start in verse 6 and kind of remind us of where Paul is going here. So starting in verse 6, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Therefore, be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So then, those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Now let's break things down a bit. First off, while I'm talking, if you get bored by what I'm saying, you start hearing bump, 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 take a moment and write down all of these passages. There are six different passages from the Old Testament that are given here that explain to us not just the purpose of the law, but the purpose of God's grace, the purpose of of God's grace to bring us righteousness that is not of ourselves, that's not of the law, but is of God's grace. Oftentimes, if we're not aware of things like this, passages like this, we can look at like, oh, well, there's different gods. You know, the God of the Old Testament is one of law and wrath and, you know, I don't like that God. So I only read the New Testament where God is all love and grace and mercy But the fact of the matter is, is that when we talk about the law and the wrath and the justice and the grace and the mercy and the love of God, we're talking about his characteristics, his very nature. And so we must understand that this is present, Old Testament, New Testament. It is all God. And so that's why coming up soon, we're going to go over the attributes of God in depth, uh, probably starting in 2017 uh, with that, but it's going to be totally worth it uh, for you to stick around for that. So let's break things down in this passage. First thing is that before the law, there was the promise. This is what we see in verses 6 and 8. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. All the nations will be blessed in you, God said to Abraham. And this was a good 430 years before the law was given. We're going to go into that next week, so I'm not going to spend too much time there. But this is the promise that God was giving to Abraham, not because he was following the law, Not because he was a particularly great man, but because God chose to bless him. And we're told elsewhere that God was blessing him not because of their great size as a people, not because of their great goodness, but because of God's choosing. Because he chose to love these people and through them to bless all nations all families, all people. So, before the law, there was the promise. So if you're in the camp of the faith, then you're blessed with Abraham. This righteousness that comes to us is by faith, not by actions. And so in Christ Jesus, Abraham's blessing is actually ours. Now, let me stop there and help you to get this because this is huge. 
Do you understand that thousands of years before you or I were born, this promise that was given to Abraham, that all the nations of the world, all the families of the world would be blessed through him. You are the fulfillment of that prophecy if you are trusting in Christ. You are the answer to that truth given to Abraham. That is huge. Now, that may not mean uh, much to, well, we're all Americans. Well, think about it like this. I'm American. Rebecca is Romanian, but now she's a naturalized uh, American citizen. But we got, we got married. She, she is of the household of faith in Romania. Then we, we have two kids that are now like Ameromanians. <laughs> and a new nation that we are praying for that they would come to faith in Christ even as we have. Jason, our youth minister, is an American. His wife, Christina, is Chilean. Amerileans, another nation to bring glory to God and to prove the word of God that by his grace, many are called to be blessed in him. This is huge. It comes through Christ. And then, of course, in the New Testament, uh, but also in the Old Testament, if you care to search, we see that we receive the promise of the Spirit By faith. We receive the Spirit of God by faith, by trusting that what God has said will come to pass. But Paul also spends some rough time here in the curse, the hard stuff. He says, If you're of the works of the law, you bear the curse. Verse 10, you're under a curse. It doesn't mean like just, ah, you got to work on this a little bit. No, you're under a curse. Why? Because if you're thinking that your righteousness, that your glory comes by obeying the law, well then that means you've got to obey all of the law and you can't do it. You can't do it. See, the law doesn't justify. It curses Now, could I have two people come up here who want to be a living illustration? You won't have to say anything or do... Okay, I saw your hand. Head up here. Anyone else? No, none of this finger stuff. Who wants to come? Oh, okay. Tabby, you were the first hand that I saw. So go ahead and come up here. Okay, so this is Joshua. Come here, Tabby. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to, oh, now you got to be over here. Okay. Now we're going to pretend just for the sake of argument that you are older than you actually are. So Joshua, you may not know this, but he's a dirty little thief. That was awesome. What was that? That came at like the perfect time. He's the thief. That was great. I hope that's on the video. (laughs) Anyway, he's a dirty thief, and he got caught. And so now he's headed to the judge. Now, Tabby, stay. Tabby, she, she is actually 16, just got her driver's permit. She's started driving. She's got a bit of a lead foot. And so she broke the speed limit law. She got caught. And now she's going before the judge. So both of them are going before. No, stay, you stay there. Both of them are going before the judge today. And so they go before the judge. And as any good judge would, so was this good judge. Wanted to find out a little bit about the situation. What happened? So he asked Joshua, hey, Joshua, so tell me a little bit about yourself. And so he said, yeah, you know, I, I stole. And I wish I didn't. And, and I wish I didn't, but I did. But you know what? I, I don't disobey my parents. And you know what? I always obey the speed limit. And so the judge goes, okay, that's great. That was a cool little moment that we had there. <laughs> so then he asks Tabby, 
She's like, Tabby, so tell me a little bit about yourself. And so she says, well, you know, yeah, I broke the law, and I, and I wish I hadn't, you know, but I did. I sped. But, but you know what? I've always obeyed my parents, and I've never stolen anything in my whole life. And so the judge said, okay, okay, wait, you know what? Josh, you, you stole, but you've never broken the speed limit. Tabby, you broke the speed limit, but you've never stolen. And so what he says is he's, I'm going to take your offenses and I'm going to put them on the other. And by that, you're not guilty. Now, what would we say about that kind of a judge? (laughs) The best judge ever. Yeah. (laughs) You know, we would be tempted to do that, right? That's the best judge ever, right? Because we see the penalty. This is the penalty. And all of a sudden, the penalty is gone. But actually, that's not a good judge. Hang your heads. You're both guilty, right? A good judge would not say, ah, you're guilty, but I'm going to do you a solid. Okay, thank you guys. You, y'all can have a seat. Good job. Give him a hand. <clears throat> so a good judge would not say, ah, you're good. You're fine. Because think about that. Where do you draw the line? What about the murderer? What about someone who is robbing a store and beats someone? What about a rapist? I mean, we see these things in our culture right now. I just read an article this past week about uh, a university student who raped another student behind a dumpster, and she was unconscious, and the judge gave him a light sentence because he didn't want his life to be negatively affected by this sentence. And the thing that I think of immediately is where were her concerns? Where was her thought when she said, I wish I could take off my skin and leave it there in the hospital with everything else? See, a good judge acquits the innocent and he punishes the guilty. Because where there is guilt, there must be punishment. And so a good judge will punish. And this is what the law points out. The law shows us our guilt and says that if you can't live by this, then you're guilty. It curses you. You practice these things, you must live by them. Leviticus 18. And so then we see in the Old Testament, but then especially in the New Testament, we see it more clearly because it's personified in Jesus. We see that the grace of Almighty God comes through faith. The righteous man shall live by faith. That is a quote from the Old Testament talking about the New Testament reality of those who are in Christ. See, faith is based on the promise from God. That's where faith is rooted. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with the character and the nature of Almighty God. But the law is based on the action from us. Ah, oh, well, you know, I'm trying to do the right things. I'm trying to keep things together as I should. But the problem is, is that the law doesn't work. See, you could say, as I've said here before, that there are actually two ways to salvation. There's two ways for God to forgive you. One is to be perfect, to obey the law in all things. And if you're anything like me, even if you're not anything like me, if you're so much better than me, it doesn't matter who you are, you know that you have failed there. You're not perfect. And that's why the law doesn't work. It requires perfection from us. James chapter 2 tells us that if you've broken the law here, 
It doesn't matter to tell the judge, well, but I've never broken this law. Yes, yes, I know I stole, but I've never sped in my car. Yes, yes, I know that I sped in my car, but I've never stolen. In James, we're told that if you break one law, it's as though you've broken the entire law. There is guilt there. And this is why the grace of God cures. Since, since our being perfect is a non-issue, that only leaves one place for us to go for salvation, and that is through Christ, through the grace that God gives us. The grace of God cures because it gives us perfection from Christ. The perfection is not something that we seek to accomplish. The perfection comes from Christ. And this is the beautiful message. So let's, let's take all of these things together and let's bring it home and revisit little Johnny and Jesus. Remember, Johnny said, I want to stay with you. And Jesus, in Scripture, tells numerous people, your sins are forgiven. I want to stay with you. Sometimes we can be like Johnny, and we can see the best and worst of those who are closest to us. How many of you have had children or known children in your lives that you've been closely interacted with and realized through them that God is teaching you about grace through them. How easily they forgive. This knocks me on my floor sometimes just thinking, well, how can you just get over it that quickly? Man, I love you for it, but what daddy did was wrong. And so daddy tells Rebecca about that, but we don't tell our kids because we want them to know that we're perfect. No, we tell our kids every time we fail, sometimes through clenched teeth, daddy messed up, mommy messed up. That's only mommy says that. I, I say daddy messed up. She can say mommy messed up. We can't say that of each other, just so you know. Sometimes we see the darkest, blackest parts of the people we know most. And it's hard. <clears throat> and with Jesus, Jesus saying your sins are forgiven. Think about Mark chapter 2 verses 1 through 12. This is the story of the paralytic who is lowered down to Jesus and Jesus looks up and he sees the faith of his friends lowering this paralytic, this man who had no use of his legs being lowered down. And don't you know that Jesus kind of knew what was going to be going on in that room. And he knew what his friends wanted. He knew what the paralytic wanted. And so what did he say? Your sins are forgiven. Can you picture the double blink of the paralytic? I, I don't care about that. I wasn't lowered down here so that you could forgive my sins. I was lowered down here so you could make me walk, that you could cause me to stand. See, sometimes when we come to, to Christ with our wants, he's going to go straight for our needs. This is what you really need. You need forgiveness, and that's what matters most. Well, some of the scribes were not cool with that. They said in their hearts, whoa, wait. Only God can forgive sins. This is blasphemy. Jesus knew what they were thinking, and I love how he brings this up. This is one of those tongue-in-cheek moments, I think, where Jesus is using a little bit of uh, time-release humor, something that people would see later and be like, Oh, oh, yeah, that's kind of funny. That's pretty witty. He says, what is easier, to tell a man your sins are forgiven? Just, eh, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven. Or to tell someone, stand up and walk. 
but so that you will know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. And he looked at the paralytic. Stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. Why didn't he say, uh, and I'm still speaking, so um, you know, pick up your mat, make some room, and stay here and listen to what I have to say? It's kind of one of those hard things of, of Jesus. Yeah, I've just forgiven your sins, and I'm going to heal you. Pick up your mat, go home. He stands up. People are like, whoa. And can you imagine the picture of the people in that moment? Whoa. Only God can forgive sins. Only God can heal the lame. Only God can raise the dead. We know these things about God. Who is this man? This is the question that we are asked throughout the gospel of Mark over and over again. Who is this man? And this is the question that I'm asking you today to ask of yourself. Who is this man? Who is Jesus? Because Jesus tells us in the word and all of scripture tells us in the word that Jesus is God and Jesus is our good judge. He is just and our justifier. Romans chapter 3. He upholds the law in his flesh and he pays the price, the penalty for breaking that law. Though he did not break the law, he pays for it in his life's blood. So, my question to you is do you know the bread of life? In John chapter 6, Jesus calls himself the bread of life. And he says, if you come to me, you will not hunger. You will not thirst. And if you come to me, I will not cast you out. He says in verse 40, John chapter 6 verse 40. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who beholds the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I myself will raise him up on the last day. Are you trusting in yourself today or in the Son? Because God's grace that brings salvation is by faith, not by any work that you can bring or do. So this morning, I'm challenging you to come to Christ. Trust in the Father's promise of the Savior. Trust in his promise that in Christ there is life and life abundant. Trust in the Son's sacrifice and trust in the Spirit's leading so that you can walk with Christ and live in Christ. Trust God in all things you will find that as you do that, he will answer your prayers. And when he does answer your prayers, this is a place for you to glory in him and to share the great works that he has done in you and around you. So as the worship team comes forward to lead us in a song of invitation, this is your chance to do the heart work and see what God is calling you to. Maybe God is calling you to trust in Christ for the first time. Maybe, like up on the slide earlier, you don't know. If I lean out and I trust in God, is he going to catch me? He will. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you're considering that this is a body of believers, though fallen, though imperfect, it's a place where you can get along with people and grow in Christ. Whatever God is calling you to this morning, I pray that you will respond. Go ahead and stand with us as we sing and come forward if the Spirit is leading you.